Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Come with me as we step into the deep, dark forest of fear, and let us pray we see sunrise in the morning. Tonight's show is the final and third part in the wonderful series by Michael G. Lockhart. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share, it really does help build the channel and our community further, and why not hashtag Team Fear. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Origins of Dogman, Part 3, The Final. Let's get straight into that. I said Georgia, oh Georgia, a song of you Comes as sweet and clear as moonlight through the pines I was never too fond of hunting, and so I sang inside my head I held no more objections to the hunt, it just wasn't my thing It involved getting up early, going out into the cold And stumbling into the woods that I couldn't see to enjoy and then sitting and waiting and wandering along specific paths. Lots of trouble for some venison, and I really didn't care for the taste that much. Deer had become scarce around my place since Lacey had been transformed. They used to wander right up into the yard. Now, they're all but gone. I can't say I blame them. I chuckled internally, as those thoughts replaced the old Ray Charles tune. However, I wanted to do something fun with Lacey. She'd been visiting the house and I thought it would be nice, a good time to spend with her in her world. If I stayed at it, I'd end up being the world's foremost expert on Dogman. Not that I could tell anyone. Let's say I was a, wait for it, lunatic. <laughs> Another internal chuckle. I was in an ebullient mood despite where I was and what I was doing. It must have been the company. Just in time for dawn, the lead doe stepped into range, and to scout for the rest, she walked by cautiously, but I was downwind in a tree stand, so no problem. I waited for the next potential, and there he was, a young buck, nice and tender and legal. As soon as I fired, the unfortunate animal jumped in pain and startlement. I heard the rush from behind me, a heavy carnivore poured past the base of the tree, and before the prey could jump, run or fall, there was a splash of blood, a tumbling blur of fur, claws and hooves, and antlers that rolled over the forest floor and ended up in a decidedly deceased severed day. Lying still on the loam, where Lacey crouched over the fresh-made corpse in a defensive posture, protecting our kill. The rest of the herd had long since scattered and fled for their lives. My little girl, Rose and howled in triumph and warning. This is my kill. If you think you can, come and take it. Otherwise, wait your turn. Once I saw that look, leave her eyes and the glowing turned back to a more reddish, I dare to speak. You know, I could just as well be the one who howls. I was standing there, dying when you finally showed yourself. Lacey gave me a dubious look that communicated, yeah, right. I slung my piece and began to carefully clamber down the ladder. The old pains had faded but not vanished, only so much a body could do with bone and bone in the knees and lumbar discs out of place. I thought Lacey could hear the creaks and groans and pops in my joints. It hadn't stopped her from ripping open the belly of the deer to get at the lovely wet, warm innards. I didn't watch. I couldn't handle the sight and even the sounds and smells of her method of eating. But... I didn't want to stare, felt voyeuristic in some way. She didn't enjoy the smells of my cooked food either, only fair. Are you going to save me a little backstrap? I asked, sounding more hopeful than I felt. And though that was the best part of the critter, to my mind, edible, even tasty if prepared properly. She looked up briefly, muzzle covered in gore and goblets of flesh. Ah, oh, that face. And then she smiled and nodded. Of course, Dad. She didn't actually say that, but we had begun to understand one another's languages. Eerie, but 
what should I expect from my pet monster? Or was that monster pet? I cut off my portion of the kill, as any good alpha would, and took it back to the house. I told her I'd be back shortly, and I was. By then she'd eaten what she wanted and hidden the rest. And we were both a little loggy, her with a fresh meal and me with my lack of sleep. It was frosty that morning, but there hadn't been a hard freeze. We found a little clearing with some sunlight and soft grass and stretched out to nap. I felt like a true wild man, a man and his dog on the hunt, now resting and enjoying the aftermath. Come and meet the latest member of our team. Tom Knox called to me from the open window of his patrol SUV, complete with its new canine logos. He stepped out and then called to a figure that had been partially concealed by the tinted windows of the vehicle. A shadowy mass with hints of fuzz soon became an energetic blur of bronze-coloured fur that came quickly to heal. Earl Brooks, meet Oscar Canine. Oscar, a Belgian Malinois, looked up at me earnestly, a mix of friendliness and reserve on his features. He interrupted his panting for a quick closed mouth gesture of professional greeting. I was getting good at reading dog and ease. I gave him a closed mouth, no teeth showing smile. Good morning, Oscar. Welcome to the force and welcome to our home. I think you're like Tom. He's a brave and true deputy and we face tremendous terrors together. Oscar cocked his head for a moment to listen and then gave a more friendly doggy grin. So, Sheriff Cloud wasn't just kidding when he spoke about a canine unit. Scoundrel never told me. Knox grinned and turned. Yes, sir. He wanted to surprise you and Lacey. Not sure she'd like Oscar, and based on the way other dogs and hounds behave around her species, I think the feeling would be mutual. You never know, though. They are related. At least they were. I don't know. It gets confusing. I agreed with the young man, and we chatted for a while. As he put Oscar back into the SUV, the working dog paused, clearly alerted to something in the line of the trees. He huffed and growled a little. Legs stiff and hair along his back and neck, roughed out to make him appear larger, to deny a grip to the fangs of another predator. He dipped his head and whined just a little bit, then turned and leapt into his transport. Knox just shook his head and then looked at me questioningly. I don't think so. I haven't seen her for a few days. Always some kind of critter in those shadows, though. I looked suspiciously towards the woods. And Tom nodded. His easy grin returned and the SUV was soon a receding dust plume. Later that evening, Lacey stopped by to check on me and relax while I had a glass of tea and awaited Miriam to get home from her office. Lacey had a nice bowl of cold water. So, did you see the new deputy? She shook her head and flicked her chin to let me know that she'd been far out into the wilderness earlier and then looked up with interest. Well, they brought in a canine. Sharp looking dog. His name is Oscar. She gave me the so what look as if the information wasn't interesting as I thought it would be. I was a little surprised. It didn't usually take much to excite her. It looks like Knox will be the handler. Explains why he hasn't been around lately. They had to go to school. You know, plain old dogs have to learn what to do and human handlers have to learn how to read doggish. Not every pooch can be superior intelligent and have conversations. She gave me her hideous, slash friendly grin and huffed out a little foul breath in my direction. And whatever else she liked hearing that she was a good girl. Well, if he wasn't here this morning, then something under the tree suddenly had Oscar stirred. Well, maybe a coyote or a fox. Lacey looked away and pretended to have an itch. and She was clearly hiding something from me, but it was apparently nothing serious. Fine, keep your secrets, kiddo. I thought as I re-scratched the last patch of her fur that had given her an itch. The beast that had once been Pete Barnum stalked through the night darkened forest. Those redneck werewolves had attacked him, and Drew Elbert had infected him with this heinous condition. What was left of his human mind laughed a little. I'd have expected any infections to come from Nancy. Skank. Regardless, he had to deal with it 
and he had to watch over his family until he could figure out a way to make it better. And then he met the other creature. He heard rumors, and Old Earl had told him about her, but she was magnificent to see. Lacey. When they first encountered one another, it was clear she stalked him, and something in her smell or appearance made his hackles rise. They were natural enemies, he knew that most, and of a skill level. Yet, she had taken pity on him, and since he knew that she had been Earl's treasured pet, and well, it led to a truce. And for a time, there was a peace between apex predators in the forest of fear. Now, he stalked a different prey. Not the feral hogs that were so abundant, and on which he enjoyed feasting. There would be no blood at the end of this hunt. He watched over his children, in this case his daughter, the youngest at age 12. She had ridden her bicycle over to her friend's home, and now the two girls sat outside, chattering in their piping voices as they sat on the porch and shared various information on their phones. He was glad to see that his baby girl had what she needed and wanted. He planned to watch her until she made it home, and so he sat in the cooling shade, and his eyes slid shut as he listened and reveled in her little voice. He awakened with a start. It was nearly sundown. The girls were gone from the porch and... No, Olivia's bike was gone. She was on her own. He had to protect her. He didn't quite know from what, but his instincts told him that her safety was his responsibility. She was his... cub. He raced along the wild patches and, when necessary, wound through the human structures and conveyances on all fours to catch up with her. He caught her scent and tracked her, and it grew stronger, and at last, there she was. She still had a bike, but she was not riding. And just a short way from home, she stood, holding the handlebars as she spoke to a trio of older girls. Hmm. These girls were too old to be her friends. And then he noted a vehicle that was approaching slowly down the street. It was familiar. Police. Yes, that's what it was. And then he caught a scent that he did not expect. He had become a terror to the local dog population, yet this one was different. It was part of the police unit. He recognized the officer as Tom Knox, a good young man. He kept Olivia safe. He relaxed a little, even considered receding back into the forest, but then that, that dog... He began to bark insanely, clearly alerted to him. He saw the shadows, but it did no good. Most dogs feared him, but this one, this one barked and was fierce in its own way. I would shred him in seconds and make a meal of him. But he would try. Brave and silly, he must be young. Officer Knox slowed his SUV to a stop near the four girls. He, of course, knew Olivia and had encountered the others around the area. He was sure he knew their families. Good evening, ladies. He waved. All the while, Oscar continued to bark and snarl insanely. Miss Olivia, I was on the way to your place. I wanted to introduce you and your brothers and your mum to our newest officer. Not sure what has him so stirred up. Oscar, quiet. It worked for a grand total of two seconds, and then the working dog started it again with growls and whines that quickly turned back into barks. I'll take him to your house. Uh, see you soon. He eyed the older three girls, who had each backed steadily away from the canine vehicle. They made quick goodbyes and walked back down the street. Olivia followed Officer Knox in his vociferous charge the rest of the way to their home. The shadow that had watched them faded back and disappeared into the woods. Miriam had apparently enjoyed the supper I'd prepared, and now that the dishes were done, we spooned on the couch and watched mindless drivel on the big screen. Not sure why I'd bought the thing, I hardly watched it. Mainly used it to watch movies. However, my grown-up girl liked it, and so I hadn't thrown anything at it lately. Teresa and Jacob are coming down for the long weekend. They really took a shine to you, and of course Jacob is infatuated with Lacey. In a healthy way. 
She quickly added to intercept the smart Alec comment she knew I'd make. <laughs> what kid wouldn't love a friendly dogman? I grinned to myself. The quip about unhealthy love interests had crossed my mind, but I had never intended to give voice to it. I loved her after a fashion, and I liked the kid. He was smart and energetic in a non-destructive way. So, can they stay for the entire holiday? Well, maybe we can invite some other folks over on Saturday. Have to let them shop on Friday. I don't know many kids in the area, but maybe we can invite Pete Barnum's brood over for a get-together. They'll have a tough time with a dad missing on Thanksgiving. Might as well keep them busy. She gave me a tender kiss. Well, you're a very thoughtful man. Those kids and their mother must be pretty worried. Still, no sign of poor Pete. I'm sure Sheriff Cloud will take care of them on Thursday. But yes, by Saturday, they will be lonely and full of heavy thoughts. Maybe we can invite Julie if she has no plans. And that nice deputy Knox. Ah, she loved to make matches. She'd have hopes for Valerie and some poor fellow. Maybe Tom, but Val was a committed city girl these days, and while we talked online, she had no plans to return to Podunk. Poor Julie still lived close, though, and she and Knox seemed to get along well. They were about the same age and both worked weird shifts. They'd understand one another. Tom drove back down the street from Pete Barnum's place, and Oscar had recovered himself and was once again seated in the back, panting with a gaped mouth grin and alternating between alertness and trying to catch a dog nap. Pete's kids had been enthralled with a new member of their dad's department, and they were good kids and the elder boy PJ wanted to follow his father's footsteps. Pete hadn't wanted that, but he knew better than to directly oppose a teenage boy. Well, big ol', did you like Pete's young'uns? Oscar licked his chops and snapped his mouth shut, and it went back to his happy panting. Tom grinned in turn and then shook his head. Thanks, buddy. It would mean a lot to Pete to know that we checked in on them. He had it in mind to check out where the three older girls had gone. If they stayed on track, they'd soon have the juvie files, and he didn't want them to try and drag down Olivia, or to just hurt her because her dad was a peace officer. It was now past dark, and they should be headed home, but none of them had parents who would be there or care whether they did homework, ate, or in any way took care of themselves. Ah, job security, he said to himself ruefully. He turned off his headlights as he approached the little park, and with his one swing set and a few picnic tables, he rolled down the window. Yep, the stench of tobacco smoke and wonderful ganja. He looked around into the poorly lit area, and there they were, all lined up at a picnic table. He put on his game face and alerted his partner. All right, buddy, time to earn your kibble, your first big small town case. He then turned off the road and onto the grass. Odd, all three of the girls were looking out into the darkness of a patch of woods, probably hallucinating or pretending to. He activated his emergency lights as the girls turned to run towards him. They screamed, and the high-pitched tones blended appallingly with a deep-throated roar of anger. A titanic black shadow thundered from the forest in pursuit. As two of the girls looked back over their shoulders, it rose to its hind legs. Crap! Another werewolf! His mind screamed as the three delinquents ran past his patrol unit. His training took over, and he hit the automatic window button for the back area, and so his new partner could join him. He stepped out and drew his sidearm, and for the second time in his life, sought to kill a werewolf. This time, however, the beast in question was not wounded, and understood the threat that that firearm posed. And with a quick and contemptuous slash of its claws, it swiped the pistol from his grip and left a pair of long, raking wounds on the inside of his right forearm. And one of the gouges immediately fountained and started pumping out the young deputy's lifeblood. And that was when Oscar overrode his fear and leapt from the patrol unit. He closed quickly on the monstrous form and sunk his teeth into the werewolf's arm. Even as it drew back from striking Oscar's partner, his pack mate. One good wound deserved another, yet size and power matter in a fight and the 
monster clamped its own enormous jaws onto Oscar's neck, which forced the loyal dog to release his grip. The werewolf slung him about a few times and then spat him contemptuously at Nox's feet. A step forward, raised his hand for another strike, and the smell of two-legged Nox thing drove his insane and dreadful hunger, and the piteous whimpers of his canine attacker stirred instincts to vanquish the foe and to remove the threat from his world. And yet, it paused, stood and quivered, engaged in a war between opposing instincts. It knew on some level where Barnum still lived that this was wrong. It should not consume the flesh of the two legs. Oh, but the hunger, it gnawed at his mind and his belly. And with a pained growl of anger and confusion, the creature stepped back and turned and fled into the night. Knox had noted a tableau that unfolded under the looming shadow of the monster that had cast over him. He was very busy tightening and locking down the tourniquet he'd taken from his duty belt. Good thing Sheriff Cloud's a tactical thinker, he thought gracefully. He'd gotten them for the entire department after the last Albert incident, and they'd practice using them on themselves and each other. Oscar whined a little, in obvious pain. His own wounds leaked blood and his eyes remained closed tightly. I got this buddy, Knox said tightly then used his radio to contact dispatch to get some help on the way. Ah, uh, maybe Julie will show. I kinda like her. His thoughts trailed off as he fought to maintain consciousness. The beast that had been Deputy Barnum ran swiftly through the small patch of trees and towards the more extensive woods at the edge of town. He'd only meant to frighten those little turds, but when they screamed and ran, his new nature rose to the forefront, and he gave chase. All pretense of any motive, but hunger was gone, as the monster subsumed the man. Now, he was frightened by what he'd done, afraid of how he could act around his family. He couldn't hurt them. He couldn't risk what would happen if one of them did something to trigger his baser instincts. Gene Cloud sat and brooded in worry about his deputy and friend. He suspected for a while what had happened to Pete. Barnum had been on duty the night Lacey Elbert slaughtered and at least partially devoured her parents. She had been full, having recently devoured her boyfriend Phil Le Fouvre, as though he was a large order of french fries. Barnum had possessed the presence of mind to call him directly, so that only those two and the JP had any idea of what the scene looked like. They had put together a team to clean the scene, and while they processed it legally, he'd done everything he could to keep the details of just how far it had gone from becoming public knowledge. Lacey Elbert was a piece of work, but nowhere near the low-life trash that her cousins had been. The Sheriff's Department had handled those two on several occasions, and they'd fought every single time, especially Nancy. He couldn't picture Lacey eating her boyfriend and parents alone. Maybe she had help from her scuzzy cousins. It had to be the nature of the beasts. He studied wares since then and believed that something in their nature subsumed whatever remained of their humanity when it came to feeding time. Phil had been good to and for Lacey Albert, yet she shredded him and devoured the meat from his corpse first. It was said in some circles that Werewolves always ended up hurting those they loved most, and part of the curse or something. He didn't buy that, but he believed strongly in the psychological harm that would come from the trauma of such a dramatic shift in the physical and instinctive nature of a person. Now his friend Pete Barnum had gone through a similar transformation into, or he wasn't sure what. His radio squawked and startled him from his reverie. He was soon on the way to the scene in fear for another of his deputies, Tom Knox. The monster situation was growing out of his control. I drove up to the office with Dr. Stone. The emergency call was about Oscar, the new canine officer. He had been mauled by an animal and was in a pretty bad shape. The deputy who had brought him to the emergency clinic sounded pretty shaken. 
Miriam had the call on speaker, and we could both tell that she was unsure how to react. Deb, we'll be there in just a few minutes. Nobody to stop us from speeding, but if there's a ticket, give it to Earl. He's driving. I smiled tightly and briefly. Miriam was pretty steady under stress. After all, she'd thrown a grenade at a werewolf. She was stressed herself, but used humour to break the tension for both she and Deputy Rose Sharon. And she was all but out the door before I came to a complete stop and dashed to the clinic doors, keys at already. I would have offered to help the deputy carry the poor canine into the clinic, but she had a good hand on him, and she was a stout woman, a part-timer. I had a momentary flashback at the sight of the blood-stained and very limp dog in the arms of the blood-smeared, frightfully concerned human. It was so similar to what had happened with Lacey, but Oscar's head dangled and his tongue lolled. His eyes were slitted and glassy with pain and shock. And he was more seriously injured than my girl had been. I held the door for the deputies, and after they and Miriam were all in the examination room, I started a pot of coffee. Dr. Stone had no need to order her orderly to do that anymore. As I puttered about in the front of the office, I heard Deputy Rose Sharon use her radio to contact Jean. Yes, sir, he's at the clinic. Doc's working to stabilize him. Any word on Knox? And Jean's voice came through with just a little electronic fuzz. Uh, he's on the way to ER. Paramedic says that it looks like the tourniquet worked. Big concern now is shock. And there was a slight pause. I'm still on scene. If you're clear, head my way and uh, bring Earl and his shotgun. Lacey noted that scent, oddly familiar from one of her earliest memories. She watched as the Elbert twins left her behind at the store, alone, abandoned, frightened and in pain. Yet relieved that the two monsters were getting farther away from her with every step, better alone than with them. She still eyed them warily, afraid they'd turn back towards her. And then, an immense creature stepped from just inside the woodline. It moved almost silently and exuded a tremendous odour. The two-legged bitch turned towards the foul smell just in time to get bitten on the shoulder. The two-legged male turned and saw the danger, too late to do more than rise his thick arm to protect himself. The old one had bitten him before he could even manage a scream of fear. He shook and tugged at the arm a little, and as both of the evil humans fell to the ground in fear and pain, he let go and turned towards Lacey. She peed a little and shrank back in terror, but the large old dog man simply favoured her with an evil grin and then leapt back into the shadows of the trees. He'd been in the area of his migration track and had observed how the Elberts had treated the poor puppy. A creature much like he'd once been, though both of his parents had already been dogmen when he was born. Some were born, some were turned. But these human creatures would now become the enemy. The monsters that he reveled in chasing, fighting and killing. Maybe the pup would get them before he returned to these woods. And she and her pack had indeed gotten them before he'd returned. And this time she knew of his presence before he knew of hers. She knew his nature and no longer feared him. Much. He was still much larger than she, and there was something wild about him that she lacked. She let out a low bark and huff towards his location. And directly, she was rewarded by the sight of her old rescuer as he peered through the spray of dead leaves in the autumn forest. When he realised that she had spotted him, he burst through the remaining screen of the vegetation and rose up to his full height in challenge and greeting. Jean greeted Deputy Rose Sharon and me when we arrived at the park. We all carried lights and long guns. It took us a while to get Deb on board with the fact that we were about to embark on a monster hunt. It just wasn't in her purview. Sheriff Cloud had unwanted word to spread but he was getting short on deputies who already knew. He'd have to trust her. He already did to a large degree. He wouldn't have hired her and kept her on for most of the past decade if he hadn't. But this, this was the kind of information that got licenses pulled for mental instability. 
Look, he said. I don't really want to wade into those trees after dark, but it's been an hour or so since the attack. Good chance he's moved out of the area, but there are too many homes around the park to make assumptions. He left a pretty clear trail. We follow it until we either catch up to him or ensure that he's left the area. Earl, this has to be strictly voluntary on your part. Are you okay with it? Yes, but Miriam, Dr. Stone, says that if you get me hurt or killed, you have to settle it with her. I grinned humorously. He nodded, and we got underway on the hideously dangerous nighttime stalk. The Peat Barnum beast rushed deeply into the woods, at first heedless of direction, shifting this way and that on the path of least resistance. The hunger raged within him. It gnawed at his innards and his mind and tattered his sensibilities. He barreled ahead once more, burning away as much of the filling as he could manage with the effort, when he barged into a sounder of feral hogs. He was amongst them before either of they or he realized it, an enormous boar, alert and on guard, charged him, and then the two collided in a brief but savage battle. The porcine mouth tore at him with its tusks and it sped past him. He gracefully stepped aside and raked his claws along its back. It spun and gaped and attempted to bite him, but he wrapped its ugly head in his arms and lifted it to his fang-filled maw. The satisfying crunch and subsequent flow of gore into his mouth and gullet thrilled him. His fellow monster squealed and grunted and thrashed to no avail. He shifted his grip and raised the 400 pounds of pork above his head and then dashed it against a tree, spine first. He heard the satisfying crack and the squeal subsided to pain whines and snorts. He threw back his head and howled in triumph and challenge. He was going to feed after all and his family was safe from his potential depredations. After a quick look around and a few sniffs of the prevailing breezes, he set to work on the feast before him, and there was plenty to fill the void within him to rend, gulp and gobble to his heart's content. Lacey and the old one stalked the trail of the enemy, and she tried to convince him that this one was different, uh, safe. Unfortunately, their language was very direct, not complex, and held few nuances. The old one scoffed and tried to make her understand that this was not a matter of whom the creature had been, but what it now was. In any case, they would find him and decide from there what to do. They shifted their pathway as much as possible to stay downwind from where the trail led. No guarantees, but it was at least a basic tactic. As they ranged forward, an intense and very loud howl emanated from the trail ahead. The sound was very near and accompanied by the smell of blood. A tremendous rustle of underbrush and dried leaves grew close, and the sound of feral hogs rushed past in genuine panic. The dogmen stepped aside and let the panicked animals proceed into the forest. Lacey, as much as her nature allowed, was relieved. She knew that the monster had not yet taken a human life. That would have led to more problems for her and for the old one and any creature of a similar build. They separated and approached a feasting monstrosity as quietly as possible. Its back was to them in the light of the waning but still gibbous and bright moon. It slobbered and munched in evident ecstasy of blood craving satisfaction. She paused, intent on letting it finish its repast before she approached. It would be calm, even loggy, after such a large meal, and perhaps willing to listen to threats since it was outnumbered. And with a roar, the old one burst from hiding and sprung upon the back of the werewolf. Even as it raised its chin to gulp down, yet another goblet of bloody flesh. The two tumbled and rolled into a now small clearing. The brush and smaller trees had been trampled somewhat by the feeding sounder, and then by the strife between hunter and prey. Now it was home to a death match between two enormous brutes that roared and bit and clawed at one another as they rolled around the forest floor. Their speed made their movements a blur as each struggled to gain a killing hold on the other. 
Lacey wanted desperately to help, but there was no room for her. The old one hadn't waited long enough to give her a chance to run in and be a distraction and perhaps cause some damage while he prepared a sneak attack as pack dogs would do. A very doggish plan, but apparently not the way a trueborn dogman did things. And she hovered, prepared to strike should an opportunity present itself. But, alas, it did not, and there was no need. The old one managed to get a fang into Pete's juggler since it had been up and exposed as he swallowed his prey. He screeched and yowled in mortal pain and fear. Every living thing fears death, even monsters. His hunger sated and the battle lost, he faded into warm thoughts of his family. He protected them. Those girls would be too terrified to leave their homes, much less bother his Olivia, but mostly he had protected them from himself, from what he'd become. Sheriff Cloud came to an immediate halt as his eyes caught the red shine and twin glow ahead. He raised his rifle but paused. I was there beside him, equally paused, and we studied the creature for a brief instant and realized that it was not a werewolf but a dogman. And then the sharp report of Deputy Roche Sharon's rifle barked out and flames burst from the barrel as she unloaded on what she saw as a monster ahead of her. She had already changed magazines before Jean could get her to stop and focus again. And meantime, I ran ahead towards the fallen form of Lacey? Oh, too big. Oh, then what? At about that time, I was engulfed in a hot, furry embrace and brushed aside to avoid any further damage from the deputy. I thumped soundly onto the ground and then the air was driven from my lungs. As I gulped in more to replace it, I caught the foul. Uh, Oh, so welcome, disgusting breath of my girl. It didn't take long to confirm that one, the enormous beast, had been Pete Barnum. The additional skin and fur sloughed from its pitiful remains, even as we watched in shock and sadness. The other creature simply melted along with him, but no dog emerged. It remained what we saw. It remained what it was, a mystery being. Lacey knew, but wouldn't be able to tell us. Some things would remain a mystery to we mere humans. It was a while before we had any celebrations. Pete's family was devastated. Knox recovered and become quite vigorous. He and Julie perched once more on my front porch, this time with her sides melded together as she traced the apparently fascinating and wonderful scars on his forearm. Miriam's mission had been accomplished without her interference, though she somehow managed to take credit. Couldn't possibly be that a man had stood his ground with yet another werewolf, and that Julie had been largely responsible for saving his life. Never a stress bond. Had to be because of something that Miriam Stone said, or did, or at least wished. This party was a send-off for Pete Jr., PJ. He was headed off to military service to get college money. There was no stopping him. He was bound and determined, just like his father, a very worthy and honourable goal. Deb was there with her husband, Glenn, and she decided that it was time to hang up the belt and badge and now worked as an EMT on Julie's crew. Jacob and the twin dogmen pups played a game of tireless tag by the way of old doggy door through which Lacey would never fit again. She eyed her pups and the two-legged youngster with a wary caution of a new mother. Teresa watched her own child, a uh, young man, closely as well. Everyone was getting along, but any misunderstandings or falsely triggered instincts could result in unfortunate events. Oscar, who was now towering above me as he stood and listened to the conversation between Jean and I, glanced at the pups and then at Lacey. They caught one another's eyes. Lacey grinned first. It would be fine. Kids would be kids, and we were a family, after all. Author's Note Oscar was a real Belgian Malinois. His handler and I were friends, and he was friends with my Rottweiler, Pasha. When Oscar first arrived at our post in Germany, he was an unknown quantity. No one had ever worked with him, 
So naturally, I volunteered to be the first to catch him during aggression training. There is an opening in the bite sleeve so that the decoy can bend his or her arm. Oscar did something unusual though. Most dogs would come in low and the decoy would crouch and then lean into their bites. Oscar. Oscar leapt. I raised my arm instinctively and pulled back my face. That thing was bad enough without any dog bites. And with my arm straight, the opening left the inside of my elbow uncovered. He hooked a tooth into the opening. He pulled the brachial artery offline, but didn't tear it. And still, I had a nice big hole in my arm. Unfortunately, we were near the Lundstall Army Hospital. And when it healed, the scar looked like the space shuttle in profile. <laughs> At least to me. A few months later, we had the Challenger disaster. And so it meant something at the time. I called Oscar one more time. I had to prove to the kennel master that I hadn't lost it. It's tradition. And after that, I ended up as his secondary handler for a couple of weeks while Kenny had to go home for a family emergency. Oscar and Pasha and the German shepherd named Elken became our demonstration team and they and we worked as a pack. We travelled around and presented information about the dogs and handling, etc. Oscar's famous snake trick created a stir and Kenny would yell, Snake! and Oscar would jump into my arms. I'm not sure the army would approve that, but that was so long ago. Any failures in description are mine, but I do speak fluent, doggonese, and doggish. Regards, Michael. Wow, 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 and another one, wow. Absolutely enthralling, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story there, Michael. Really enjoyed this one. Um, just a totally different angle once again. Um, quite a heartfelt story at times and lots of action in between and lots of giggles as well. I do like the comical twist that you instill into all of your stories, Michael, much like myself. As ever, brother, I hope you enjoyed my rendition of your incredible work. Guys and girls, you know the drill. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear. If you haven't subscribed to DMT Forest to Fear, what are you waiting for? And where have you been? Smash that subscribe button and why not throat punch the notification bell to stay up to date with all DMT videos and community posts. I literally have an inbox of nothing but pure fire. Um, I've got some cracking stories that I'm going to bring back for you guys. I've got a second return of the uh, Porcine Horror by Michael Lockhart as well. I'll probably be releasing that tomorrow if not the day after. I've got a brand new series from my wonderful friend Wayne Harbison titled The Feline Factor. Set in the 1920s in a sort of vampire scenario and genre that I'm sure you guys will definitely sink your teeth into as ever. And lots lots more. And of course guys, I hope you're all well and happy, focusing on the positives, and keep punching. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.